Good morning, dear colleagues. Very happy to see you all at 9.00 in the main hall. I warned some people yesterday evening that you can dance, you can party, but 9 o'clock sharp. So I'm really, really glad to see you all here. And uh, I am also very glad to present uh, our Friday keynote speaker, Professor Rosemary Deem. She comes from uh, Royal Holloway, University of London. She is uh, Vice Principal of Education and Dean of the Doctoral School, as well as Chair of the UK, UK Council for Graduate Education. So, you guessed already that uh, this will be about doctoral education today. <clears throat> She holds a BA, uh, Social Sciences in Economic History and Sociology, and uh, a Master's in Sociology of Education from Leicester University, and a PhD from the Open University course, uh, Women and Leisure, a Sociological Investigation. Her main research interests focus on policy, leadership, governance, and management of higher education, the consequences of university leak tables, doctoral students, the changing purposes and roles of universities, public service organizations, leadership and change agency, and equality in education settings. This work draws on organizational theory, policy analysis, feminist research, new managerialist theory, and comparative social science. Her latest research is examining how austerity measures by Western governments in response to the 2008 financial crisis in banking are affecting the values and organizational shape of public services. So, Rosemary covers just all fields we discuss <laughs> in UNIQUE. The best keynote speaker, the last keynote speaker in the UNIQUE project, I must say. Yeah. So, Rosemary, I, I am really happy, and on behalf of uh, uh, UNIQUE Tribe, many thanks to come. The title of your keynote speech is Doctoral Education, a mirror for the future of higher education. So, another connection, <laughs> doctoral <laughs> education and futures, university futures. The floor is yours. Okay, well, thank you very much. What I'm going to try and do, this is a kind of gallop through some of the debates about doctoral education, which are maybe not quite as exciting as some of the debates we've been having during the conference so far, uh, but you'll see why that is in a minute. Um, and what I want to do is to link what's happening in doctoral education to features of, of universities as organisations in the current situation, changes in academic work, and how those both affect and are affected by what has happened to the doctorate. And then to talk about a few features of contemporary doctorates, because it's quite a complex area. It isn't a single kind of phenomenon, but quite a few different ones. To say something about some criticisms of the doctorate, uh, and then to just finish by talking about how doctorates might develop in the future. So if we look at the doctoral degree, then... Clearly, the landscape is, is still changing quite a lot. I think for a long time, perhaps nothing much did change, but recently, a great many things have changed, and everybody's writing about the doctorate. And it's everything from how people are funded to what kind of supervision people get, what kind of thesis people write, what the format of the thesis is, how they actually frame what they're doing. Is it interdisciplinary? Is it monodisciplinary? Now, the traditional, if you can talk about that, and it's quite a contentious concept, but the traditional doctorate is essentially supposed to be a preparation for academic work, but partly because there are so few permanent jobs in academic institutions now, that's no longer the case. Uh, some people are not even sure if it does prepare for academic work, but clearly the expectation is that many people who get doctoral degrees will go and do something else. Unfortunately, when you talk to them, that's not always what they think or say. So that's the belief, but it isn't necessarily held by those who are doing it. And clearly, there are a lot of different changes which are affected in the doctorate, which, sh which are actually reflecting what else is happening in higher education. So that the kind of move to a greater emphasis on performativity is also a feature of the doctorate. 
So what marks out a 21st century university? I should say that one term I am not going to use is the term neoliberal because I have no idea what it means. It's an elastic concept and I don't think it's very helpful. But there are obviously lots of features of a 21st century university. So clearly the external environment, both in terms of internationally and nationally, is quite a turbulent one in most countries. Universities are becoming much more business-like, and so that leads to lots and lots of questions about what their purpose is. Unlike some critics, I don't think of the university as broken. I know some people have used that phrase quite a lot during the conference. I'm not sure how helpful that is. Increasingly, it's the economic dimension of what universities do, whether that's research or preparing graduates, that is emphasised rather than the social and cultural dimension. Contemporary universities are highly managed uh, and there's a lot of emphasis on trying to avoid risk, although people are not always very good at deciding what risks are going to affect them. I remember my own institution had a long list of risks that were going to affect us and two years ago we were massively affected by floods. Did floods appear on the list of risks? No. So it just goes to show that you can't always predict the future in terms of risk either. And obviously universities have become massified in many countries and the social composition is changing and there's much more emphasis on partnerships and collaboration. It's also useful to kind of think what is a 21st century university? So here are just a few images of universities in different places, in different countries. Now, those two probably look less like the 21st century university than the first two, but it's not actually what the buildings look like, it's what happens inside that's the crucial point. So, what are some of those characteristics? So, polarisation around research or teaching intensity is becoming much more common. So, instead of having institutions which do both, and that's obviously the, the kind of classic kind of debate about Humboldt versus Newman, uh, increasingly people are specialising. It can be public, it can be private, it can be a hybrid. We know that in many countries, but not all, the notion of a market for students is, is growing in importance, but sometimes those markets are fixed. And that, that's certainly happening in the UK at the moment, where we're told that new providers, who will almost all be for-profit providers, are actually more important than the incumbents that they're going to replace. The private interests of students are often emphasised against anything else, so that overtakes the notion that knowledge is for knowledge's sake. New technologies are clearly important. Social media is important. E-learning is often no longer separated out from other kinds of learning. You have multi-skilled staff, and I'm not just talking about academics, but also administrators, but students who act like consumers, who think that actually they're buying a, you know, they're buying a piece of equipment or they're buying you know, a new piece of clothing, it's exactly the same. You buy university education in the same way. And again, in the UK, we've already seen the Competition and Markets Authority is now trying to tell us what goes in our curriculum and how many years in advance that has to be available, not only to actual accepted applicants, but also to applicants who've not yet made a decision about where to go. So that's quite a new development, and I think extremely dangerous. So how do organisational changes to universities affect the doctorate? First of all, I think that one of the things that's happening is that supervising doctoral candidates becomes just another thing that you do. It's no longer necessarily something really special that you really look forward to. It's just another chore. Even if the actual activity itself is quite interesting and, and intellectually stretching, it's not necessarily something that is anything different in many ways, to other things that you do. And there's much more emphasis on submission and completion of theses as a kind of key metric. Nobody's very interested in the academic content or the contribution to knowledge, except in the examination process. The crucial thing is that it's finished, not that it's any good. As long as it passes, then that's fine, because that's quite a problematic assumption, that actually the most important thing is for it to be submitted, not whether it's any good. And there is, as you'll know from Unique, the greater stress on collaboration, both across institutions and internationalising of the whole experience. And the destinations of holders of doctorates are now scrutinised much more carefully. 
and the costs and benefits of doctoral programmes are things that university managers like to stare at when they're getting bored with their other spreadsheets and league tables. There are also changes to academic work, which have been discussed quite a lot during the last two days. So, casualisation and the precarity of academic work is becoming more and more common across more and more systems. There's collectivisation, much more interdisciplinary work, centres, teams, doctoral schools. Specialisation, so that maybe some staff do teaching only, some people do research only, some people do management only. Christine Muslin's point that academic work is no longer as special as it was, that it's actually much more like other kinds of work, and so it doesn't have some of those distinctive features that it might have had in the past. There's also the whole kind of emphasis on mobility and virtualization. So in some systems, clean or all, there's quite a high academic turnover. In most systems, academics travel a lot. They might be online, but they're out of the office that they're, like all of us, I guess, um, that distance learning, MOOCs, and all of these things change the notion of where the centre of gravity is in terms of higher education. And the speeding up of academic work leads to quite varied responses. And the notion that somehow that some doctoral students have, that if they send you a file at midnight, that miraculously by 8.30 the next morning, you would have read it. Because after all, you've had all those hours, haven't you? And what have you been doing? So, speed up affects everything. And increasingly, academic work is digitised work, even if people don't necessarily like technology. So, how do those changes to academic work actually affect the doctorate? So, firstly, in terms of casualisation, it affects whether doctoral students have a future in the academy, and if they're teaching part-time, which many of them are, how much they get paid and whether that work is really valued. In terms of collectivisation, then full-time doctoral education is much more likely now to be in terms of collaboration with other departments in the same institution, between different institutions, which may be in that country or another country. Specialisation. Doctoral education is becoming a field in itself with the growth of doctoral schools and colleges. The mobility of academics and the virtualisation can reduce face-to-face -face contact with supervisors, and that may mean the experience is not as valuable as it might have been in the past. And many supervisors have more students who are doing doctorates, so that the students are not special anymore, and there's much greater pressure that those students conform to regulations around the submission of the thesis and what they have to do in order to get there, and also particularly outputs, because unless you produce outputs, then the whole thing then becomes problematic. Oh, this, this is an interesting slide about the share of doctoral students out of all higher education students on Bologna programmes in 2012. It's quite hard to get really up-to-date information on doctorates, but it's interesting because the countries that have the highest share um, are actually Germany and Austria and Finland, and, and also Luxembourg, which is barely counts as a country because it's so small. Um, it's quite interesting to look at that. Of course, you also have to look at the size and the percentage of the population that goes into higher education. But it's nevertheless kind of worth thinking about what that balance is between all students in higher education and those who are doing doctorates. And if you look at the kind of world statistics, then, again, there's quite a lot of variation between countries. Um, so in Switzerland and Sweden, the graduation rates are quite high, uh, and a relative increase in doctoral students was highest in this period, which is actually, although it was published in 2011, I think some of the statistics are slightly older than that, in, in the Slovak Republic and Portugal. In terms of gender, slightly less than half of the OECD average were women, um, but if you look at the subject mix, then that's quite a big difference. So women are still very underrepresented in science and engineering, except in something like biological sciences. Um, and then the next, so you do get exceptions to that. We better not mention Iceland and Portugal in the same sort of session, have we, because of football. Um, but anyway, we'll gloss over that one quickly. Um, the largest share of new doctorate degrees in science and is in science and engineering, followed by the social sciences for men and by health and welfare for women. 
And the absolute numbers of science and engineering doctorates have increased significantly since 2000, but that's actually declining in most OECD countries. And the USA, I'm sure you won't be surprised to know because it's the biggest system, is the largest single contributor of new doctorates. But actually that's followed by Germany, the UK and France. And the, the 20 EU countries, of which no doubt the UK will soon be not one, um, combined account for more than half of the total numbers of doctorates. So it's quite a disparate pattern across different countries, but there are clear trends in that. And then the question about who does the doctorate, what kind of knowledge is privileged in the doctorate? Firstly, there's really a considerable amount of variation by discipline. In most, but not all, STEM subjects, doctoral candidates are more likely to be male and more likely to be full-time. In humanities and social sciences, more, there are more women, there are more part-timers, but ethnicity, social class, disability remain challenges in lots of countries and may be a genuine barrier to actually doing a doctoral degree. Harker notices that the gender balance of disciplines affect how students are selected, what is done, what value is attached to the knowledge that's produced. And in some disciplines, she observes, there are still very essentialist views about gender and a belief that men and women contribute differently to the same disciplines. And gender equality measures, as we've seen in other fields, are often only seen to apply to women. Danovitz's research, where she looked at an interdisciplinary doctoral programme, suggests that candidates talk about things which are not necessarily the same as, as other candidates and other programmes, but the things, some, obviously the stuff about jobs is common, but there's much more discussion about power relationships and also about how to actually think about the embodiment of doing their course of study. So recent developments in the doctorate itself. I mean, these I think are difficult to really generalise about across different systems, but it does seem to me that there is much more emphasis on the training PhD rather than the knowledge PhD, which is ironic given the title of the unique project itself. And, and I'm not saying that applies to this one, but I think there is an issue about what the balance is between training someone to be a researcher and getting them to produce a fundamentally original piece of research because it seems to me those things are intention. And in the days when people took a long, long time to do a PhD thesis, then there was a different assumption around what that work represented. Often the assumption was that this is your great work, that this was the, the magnum opus, you would never do a better piece of research. We now know that that's extremely unlikely that that will be the case. Also, there are a proliferation of different types of doctorate. And again, this varies a lot by system. So some countries have what they call an industrial doctorate, which is essentially focused on a particular industry, and the project is done in combination with that industry. There may be coursework as well as um, the actual dissertation, but not quite in the same way as in the US system, where the coursework precedes you actually moving on to that stage. There's clearly greater collaboration in doctoral education in all sorts of ways, and there's increased focus on the contribution of doctoral graduates to a wider range of occupations, not just academia. Unfortunately, what there isn't very much is an emphasis on what that wider social and cultural role might be. And then finally, there are changing perceptions of the roles of doctoral candidates. Sometimes, fortunately, they're allowed to speak for themselves, but quite a lot of research it takes upon itself the opportunity to speak for them without necessarily asking them, which is probably not a terribly helpful thing to do. Now, when I was doing the preparation for this lecture, I looked at some of the literature that's around from various kinds of bodies that represent universities in different countries. So this is from something called the Leading European Research Universities. Um, and it, it tries to sketch out what a model of the modern doctorate looks like. So doctoral researchers are drivers of their professional development. I've no idea what that actually means, but it sounds quite fancy. I suspect it doesn't mean a great deal, except you probably have to work out what it is you're supposed to do, and nobody tells you. They only tell you afterwards that you should have done it. <laughs> that you need to be immersed in a research-rich environment, but that works better probably if the people are actually around. If they're not around, then that probably isn't quite so successful. 
where boundaries to other research fields are highly permeable. But the attitude of different doctoral students to interdisciplinarity is quite considerable, that some people really embrace it and want to do it, other people are very scared of it because they feel that it's, in some way it's questioning the particular discipline that they want to work in. Connections to the external world. This is a bit like a mission statement, isn't it? This, I mean, a lot of the, these kind of documents are like this. So they have a global outlook. We don't really know what a global outlook is exactly. You know, you look out and you see the entire world. Clearly not in Denmark this week because it's been raining most of the time, so you can barely see Copenhagen, never mind the rest of the world. But obviously, these things are weather dependent. There's a link to other sectors of society. Well, that's quite useful to know, but it doesn't explain how. And the skills that these new doctoral graduates develop are highly valuable. OK, so does this help? No, probably not. So then I looked at another one, which somebody told me was the last exciting world in what was happening to doctorates. So this is from the European Universities Association Council on Doctoral Education, which I think spent about four days locked in some hotel somewhere in Europe producing this. When I first saw this document, I thought maybe I'd just got the executive summary because there didn't seem to be much of it, but in fact I discovered this was the entire document. So here are some of the gems. Institutional structures are diverse and open. Well, some of them are. Um, but we need to watch for inefficiencies because not everybody has doctoral schools. Well, that's also useful to know. That we need to create space for dialogue between researchers and doctoral candidates. I think we've known that probably for a couple of centuries, possibly. Um, but maybe they weren't noticing at the time. That we need to build research capacity, yes, using strong institutional leadership. But what does that mean? Because institutional leadership often knows nothing about research these days and hasn't really got any idea, except whether it appears in the lead table. So a definition of, of institutional research strength is what it says in the lead tables, not what people are actually doing. So you're supposed to nurture talent at all levels, presumably helped by human resources, or as Rebecca Bowden calls them, human remains. Focus on rigour. I think I've seen that somewhere uh, in a UK research excellence framework analysis. Resilience. I don't know what that's supposed to mean. Originality, critical thinking, independence, ability to create new knowledge. I think we have to do this in everybody from primary school upwards. So by the time you get to the doctorate, one might hope that there were sort of some new things that were being developed. You have to, you have to develop the ethos of research integrity. That's a new phrase which has replaced the word research ethics, I believe. So if you weren't quite sure what it meant, then that's probably what it means. And then finally, they tell us that you have to meet the digital challenge and foster open access research. Even finding this document suggested that maybe open access <laughs> research was not at the forefront of their agenda when they produced it. OK, I'll just say a little bit about collaborative doctoral networks. I know somebody um, here is already looking at that. Karina Balaban's already looking at this. And she's comparing the Marie Curie <coughs> networks with, with the US version funded by the National Science Foundation. But there are clearly other things that have been similar to that, those things in the past. So Framework 7 in the EU had networks of excellence, which involved quite a lot of PhD students. In the UK, we have now a lot of collaborative inter-institutional doctoral training partnerships. Um, clearly, all of these interdisciplinary, they're national or they're international, and they emphasise the knowledge contribution and the future career preparation, both inside and outside academia. The, I think they're great models. The problem is they're also very expensive. And then the question is, is that sustainable? for higher education systems to do things like that. It's only ever going to be an elite thing, that's fine, but even that is actually, I think, going to be challenged quite a lot. So they're great models, but how do we take the principles underlying those models and apply them to other students who are not as privileged, maybe particularly part-time students, who often don't get access to a lot of things that full-time students get access to? If we look at what, what the kind of policy makers are doing with doctoral education, I think um, as Cuthbert and Moller said that maybe they were talking about Australia, but I think the point is a more general one, that many governments have decided that doctoral education is far too important to just be left to universities. Clearly there's an emphasis more and more on doctoral programmes, not just the individual experience. There's a lot of focus on that horrible word, employability, 
um, but not on the wider cultural and social roles of people with doctoral degrees. Constantly the contribution to economic growth, but also innovation, which is a bit like originality, because the definitions of innovation and originality vary hugely by discipline. The full-time science model, however, is very evident in policies all over the world on higher education because the assumption is that people who come and do a PhD are actually young, they're male, they're full-time, and that that is what you're aiming for. And that clearly is quite problematic. And doctoral submissions and completions are key metrics, but nobody takes the societal contribution into account, partly because it's difficult to measure. And we all know that if you can't measure it, then you can't actually count it, and therefore it doesn't get included. But that seems to me is a real pity. And there's a mass of books on kind of the doctoral crisis, how to reshape the doctorate, new pedagogies. These are just two examples. They relate to all kinds of countries. And there's also a mass of research. Um, I mean, as a journal editor, I probably get about two articles a week on doctoral education, much of which could be described as, I talked to my five doctoral students, I did a focus group, I gave them some interviews, and here are the results. They're interesting people, they're doing interesting things, and occasionally they talk to other people. Could be a, quite a good summary of some of those articles. Clearly, some of them are not as simple as that, but it is a field in which people find it very easy to do what I would say are largely insignificant pieces of research, which I think is a problem because clearly you need to do much more cumulative research. You can't just assume that if you do these tiny little pieces of research and you don't link them up, that actually they tell us anything that we didn't know already. Now, there have been a lot of criticisms of the doctorate, and I think one of them is clearly this business about Firstly, are there too many doctoral graduates? But that can only be measured if you assume that the only purpose of the doctorate is to prepare people for academic work. But on the other hand, it may be that the doctorate, even for those people who end up as academics, is no longer sufficient because it doesn't routinely, depends on the country, include anything to do with teaching, although people will often be doing teaching alongside it. And also, perhaps it doesn't prepare particularly well for other kinds of work either, particularly when the potential employers didn't even know that they needed PhDs and may be terrified of employing PhDs when perhaps they themselves don't even have a first degree. There's also the question about what format the thesis actually should appear in. So is a monograph-only version of a thesis the only kind of thesis that we should have? Because increasingly there are other variants of that. Does it work better in some disciplines than others? Is the ability to produce a monograph useful in every field or only in some fields? The oral defence, Australia doesn't have it in most institutions, although they're considering having it. Most other countries have it, but the form of it varies. So in the UK, it's a highly secret thing where nobody except the people who were present know what went on. In other countries, it's an open defence, but that often is preceded by a sift to make sure that the thesis itself is of examinable quality. So it is a slightly different kind of examination. The advantage of that, though, is that everybody can go and have a look and see what goes on. Whereas in the system where it's a closed viva, as we have in the UK, it's highly problematic. And there's somebody who has to deal with appeals and complaints about vivas. There are often all sorts of problems in trying to sort out what actually went on in a viva when all the participants have some interest in the outcome. One-to-one -one supervision may be giving way to more collective forms. There's a debate about that and what that actually means. And what it can mean is that the student then becomes very, very confused because 10 different people are trying to tell them what to do and how do you decide which of the 10 people you actually follow. And if you get that wrong, that can have lots of consequences. And there's someone called Tim Blackman, who recently became Vice-Chancellor of Middlesex University in the UK, he made a speech in Belfast in March, in which he said that what we call the professional doctorate, which is also quite similar to an industrial doctorate, so that you do set courses before you actually embark on the dissertation, and they all count to the final degree, and that... In a professional doctorate, the assumption is that you will probably already be in a job and that what you do is you look at 
aspects of that job, and those form part of your thesis. That's that the actual, this doctorate was going to wipe out the conventional doctorate. Um, and someone said to him, but how's that going to work in science? He said, oh, I haven't thought about that. So that was a bit of a disadvantage with that. So it's all very well making these sweeping statements, but if you can't follow them through, then maybe they're a bit problematic. And clearly doctoral structures can, they're not all big and successful and collaborative, some of them are quite small. And this is the point that the EUA document I referred to just now makes. Now some people have talked about a doctoral crisis. If you go through the literature, you can find mention of a doctoral crisis for about the last 30 years. So clearly whatever kind of crisis it's, it is, it's not coming to any kind of head anytime soon. But they talk about the shift in policy focus. Again, they're mainly talking about Australia, but they're trying to extrapolate that to other countries. That the shift is from efficiency, how quickly do you get people through, to the skills that doctoral graduates are supposed to have. That, as, as many other people have said, doctorates are no longer just preparation for academic work. Questioning what originality means, questioning what contribution to knowledge means. And there's been some research which suggested that many theses do not t contain the term contribution to knowledge. I don't really see why that should matter, but apparently some people think it does. Proliferation of doctoral types in some countries, particularly the USA, Australia and the UK. Questioning about whether different kinds of doctorates have equivalent outcomes. I think that's quite a difficult one because it seems to me that they probably don't. And that maybe, maybe that matters, maybe it doesn't. I mean, that's something that probably does need some more systematic research. And are doctorates a new form of credentialism? Well, you could say it's an old form of credentialism. Clearly, the notion of credentialism is, is many decades old. But if more and more people have doctorates, then it's no longer a sign of distinctiveness. So why do we still have the doctorate? Is it about tradition? Is it about the contribution to the knowledge economy? Is it about developing expertise and applying it in wider society? Of course, if you're in a lab-based discipline, you need research students to people your lab. And so that's one of the reasons that scientists have a different attitude often to research students, to social sciences uh, and arts humanities. And in theory, the right to award research degrees is still a symbol of the university's autonomy. But I think I'd question for how long that's going to be the case. So, is it tradition or is it something else? What could we actually change in the doctorate? Well, we could change who we recruit, we could become much more selective, but focus perhaps on the notion of people being versatile, because I hate the word flexibility because it has so many problematic connotations, and also kind of the notion of future leaders, although you don't always know what it is they're going to be leading. How we fund, so there could be fewer candidates, which goes with the kind of selectivity, but ha perhaps more generous stipends, because we know that financial problems are, a lot, are one of the main reasons why people drop out of PhDs and other doctorates. How we train and supervise, more substantial international experience, but of course it costs money, not everybody can afford to do it. What we prepare doctoral graduates for, and the kind of knowledge doctoral candidates produce and for whom. So the emphasis, as in the sociology of science, on the co-production of knowledge is beginning to happen in some doctorates. So the co-production is not just with the supervisor, which has always been there, but the co-production with people in outside organisations. So there are lots of things we could change, but the question is, is that actually going to happen? Now, um, Balaban has looked at a couple, some of, I think three of the kind of texts in this field and said there's an interesting shift in how students are regarded, noting that none of these books have really actually asked students whether they think this is happening. So you go through the notion of students as stewards of their discipline, that's a very kind of monodisciplinary approach, the kind of shared formation apprenticeship emphasis and then on to the kind of notion as leaders. So. But I think the question I would have with that is whether that's happening in all forms of the doctorate, or is that only the elite full-time PhD students who are in these collaborative um, outfits rather than, let's say, the part-time student or somebody doing a professional doctorate. So, I mean, clearly these, these things overlap to some extent, um, but I think we need to come back to the point I made earlier, that no matter how much policy makers and universities might stress that PhDs are not just about being an academic, 
many, many PhD candidates, much less so professional and industrial doctorates, want to be academics, even though they know that there's a very short chance of that happening. So, is the doctorate a mirror for the changing university? And how might the 21st century university change in the future? Well, we don't really know, but we've had lots of kind of speculation at this conference so far about the university might disappear, we might replace it with all kinds of other things, some of which seem to me to be a bit equivalent to the mechanics institutes in the 19th century, but um, maybe a knowledge of history is not always a useful thing. So, clearly there are going to be a much bigger variety of organisational forms. Multinational organisations that are not educational in many senses, but just see the possibility of a profit. We've already got many, many transnational campuses. We've got lots of online universities. You disassemble, perhaps, the degree validation from recruitment and teaching. You might have cooperatives like Mondragon. You might have elite campuses like Harvard and Oxford. So there will probably go on being that variety of organisational forms. And it's quite likely that some of those universities, maybe most of them, will be focused on undergraduate and vocational programmes with fast, efficient, quotes, delivery. Fewer permanent staff, less permanent space for people to teach in, Casualised labour, perhaps robot tutors in rented rooms is one possibility. That would be quite, a, quite an interesting example of the future, wouldn't it? Technology-driven rather than technology-informed, the digitisation of everything, learner analytics, which I think is really ethically problematic, where you kind of find things that students have done. How often do they go to the library? Did they read the book they took home? Do they participate in the virtual learning environment? And then you go and terrorise them because they haven't done something. So some people think this is an advance. Research could also, of course, be done by artificial intelligence. So soon you won't need academics. You just set the machine up and you come back in a week and it's done the research. You probably won't get any money to do it, but you know, and it may not be very useful, but at least something will have happened. Flip lectures, I mean, that's the latest trend. I know it's been around for quite a long time. But increasingly, maybe the production of materials for teaching and the teaching itself become separated. And research and research-informed teaching is probably likely to be only at elite institutions. So many of the others will not have research at all. So can we unbundle the doctorate? So Pedersen on Wednesday morning in the opening plenary suggested that universities will balance the loss of the research dominance with more emphasis on the production of PhDs. But I think that that's... Well, firstly, I think there's the question about whether they will continue to have the autonomy and the right to offer those degrees, and that is being questioned in some systems. But it's already possible and is done whereby you separate out the initial methods and research development of doctorates. You can do that online, you can do it face-to-face, -face, you can do it all sorts of ways, that you could outsource the field work, the archival work, the laboratory work. You could have a supervision, a mix of external organisations and casualised staff, actually, or you could just use online monitoring. You could probably do your supervision using learner analytics. You could find out whether they were concentrating, how much they looked at their phone when they were actually sitting there, how much they looked out of the window. Perhaps that's not so popular these days. Um, so there's a lot of scope there, I think, for doing supervision in a different way. And do you actually need anything at the end of it? So if you still need a validating institution to award this unbundled doctorate, maybe in future you'll just buy it in a kit. You just go to a shop and, or you go online, you get a little kit and you, you just click on something and it activates the validation. Up comes the ceremony, picture of you in the ceremony, picture of all your friends, and that's it. It's over. So that could be the future. So what I've tried to do is to examine how organisational changes to the university and changes to the nature of academic work have themselves had some effect on doctoral degrees and vice versa. And I've also tried to look at recent developments and features of doctoral programmes, including the proliferation of types of doctorate, collaborative programmes, and the changing roles of doctoral students. And finally, I looked at criticisms of the doctorate and the notion of a doctoral education crisis, as well as doing some speculation about what might happen in the future. 
So, in conclusion, I mean, I think clearly as types of universities continue to change, then doctoral education will also change, and clearly the economy is also changing too, so you have to look at that. We can't just look at doctoral education as a, as a little cocoon which we can separate out, which unfortunately is what many research papers tend to do. If there are fewer research-intensive universities, there probably will be much more selective admission to full-time doctorates. New for-profit providers are almost certainly not going to see doctorates as a priority. But, of course, some of them will need PhD students for some of their teaching. I think preferably, in their view, ones that were trained and paid for by somebody else. And obviously, the notion of knowledge co-production and collaborative schemes will grow as consistent with open access principles. But I think it's also the problem that collaboration and competition don't go together terribly well. So at the one hand, universities are urged to collaborate with each other, but on the other hand, they're told that they're in competition with each other. And how you square that circle, I think, is quite challenging. And maybe you could establish cooperatives that could run PhD programs. I think that would be quite an interesting development. So if the doctorate survives, and I think there are questions about that, then obviously we need to prepare candidates for a much broader spectrum of things. But it's really important that that includes social and cultural purposes. The concept of originality in a thesis, I think, is going to be increasingly challenged. It's already a bit like neoliberalism. It's a very elastic concept. It covers everything, but it looks awful. And that's one of the problems. The doctoral candidates will still need preparation for things like digitisation, translational knowledge, but not just for careers, and transferable skills. But those, those, again, are kind of things that are already happening. That if co-production and collaborative contributions become the norm, then that questions the extent to which individuals receive doctoral degrees rather than groups of people. And finally, could we be heading for doctorates written by artificial intelligence? It can't be far away. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, thank you also for uh, leaving us more than 15 minutes time. This is most of uh, this conference. I'm sure that uh, there are many questions uh, in the room and uh, the floor is open. And we have a micro. Yeah. Yeah. Where is it? Yeah, this one. Okay. <coughs> yes. Maresi. On the on the right side. Okay. I have several comments, of course. <laughs> um, first, I want to say one really need to differentiate by um, more the British type of doctorate, including the Australian and the US type. It's really very different. Mm -hmm. So I think it was all put together, and there's quite a difference. Mm -hmm. Second, I would say that assumption that most who do a doctorate right now want to become professors is actually not correct. Um, I checked in, in, if you take country like Germany, there was always a tradition that the majority is elsewhere. In the US, I even checked in the high time of expansion of doctorate, humanities and social science, a good proportion also went outside. But it's inside that myth is perpetuated. And I just did some study on taboos in doctoral education. And one of the taboos, and it seems to be in most country, is that doctoral students never tell their supervisor they do not want to become professor because they're afraid they're not taking seriously. They're afraid they wouldn't get the financial support. They're afraid to be treated as second class citizen. So I think we need to also see what's the reality. Yeah. And my third comment is, yes, when you take Lero and the AU, this are kind of prescription, but when you look on the ground, and you know that so well, mm -hmm. what's really happening, there is something else going on. Yes, we have worldwide, uh, uh, over, I would say, an overproduction of PhD right now because with the belief in innovation and whatever knowledge economy, many 
governments have mm. pushed for an increase in PhD. Mm -hmm. But I think looking and saying, you know, artificial intelligence, I think, I cannot speak, but I can speak for the US where I really know one is very aware about, and we did in our recent book, a kind of canvas around the world, the a PhD, the research education, is still needs to have original contribution. Mm -hmm. And very much what is also in the US and even the National Science Foundation, very much to look what's the societal impact mm -hmm. and not just mm -hmm. the workforce. Mm -hmm. So I would say taking what the rhetoric is of LERO, mm -hmm. AU or mm -hmm. others, and what is also on the ground is mm -hmm. quite some difference. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't disagree with you most of those points. I mean, I think the American system is totally different, and I did make that point. I think the, other one, but the difficulty is you end up not being able to say anything about doctoral education if you constantly have to say, well, these things are different. So I did try and incorporate that, but I think it's impossible to constantly do that through, through a kind of coherent presentation. So I'm very well aware of that. But there are some overlaps between the American system, because if you look at the professional doctor, then that's clearly a feature of the American system, as well as some European systems. So there are some, although the actual time that's taken and the way it's organized are very different, there are nevertheless some similarities. So when the professional doctorate developed in the UK, they went to the US to look. So it's not always the case that those systems are completely parallel. I mean, your comments about you know, what, what is happening in different places, again, I think those are really important to make. And obviously, if you're doing a contextualised analysis, which if you're doing individual studies, has to be done. I think I'm not... The point about whether students want to be academics or not, I mean, I think, yes, you, you can look at surveys and you can look at kind of what people say. I think your point, however, later, was to say that in different contexts, candidates say different things. So what they will say to their supervisor is not necessarily what they would say if somebody was giving them a survey. And it's probably also not what they would say if they were being individually interviewed. So I think it's actually quite hard to find out what they really do think. But clearly, if a lot of people do think that they're going to get academic jobs, and in some systems they do still think that, then that's potentially a problem. If they think they're going to be going into other fields, that's fine. But in some countries, that's still quite difficult because those other fields haven't accepted doctorates. So I think what we're pointing to is the enormous variation across what's happening. What, what I was trying to do was to pull out some of those things. Yes, I agree that things like Nehru and, and the European um, Universities Association are reflecting a particular thing. But my point was that those things are read by large numbers of people. And that it's not, but what I feel is that they're saying nothing that's particularly new. So they're presented as though this is the last word in what's happening, but they're not. So that it wasn't really to, to hold them up as some kind of example. That was the last thing I was trying to do. I was trying to be critical of those things. Thank you. Next. Yes, please. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. As a representative of the Eurodoc, European Council of Doctoral Candidates and Junior Researchers, I can be indifferent in this topic. Uh, thank you for a great presentation, but I'm wondering why the voice of junior researchers on the European level, I mean the position of Eurodoc, wasn't considered and taken into consideration like LERU or EUA CDE uh, position. So uh, in 2012, uh, Eurodoc accepted and published actually policy paper and sent it to different institutions, policy makers, universities and so on, uh, about uh, doctoral candidates and doctoral training. And actually the position which are we trying to be heard from the side of uh, doctoral candidates on the European level is the professionalism of doctoral training and uh, treating doctoral candidates as professionals. And actually I would like also to mention that um, uh, we are trying to endorse European Charter for Researchers and Code of Recruitment for mm. Um, mm. Uh, researchers. Mm. And actually, this, this document hasn't been mentioned yet mm. during mm. the whole conference. Mm. Mm. But a lot of issues which were being discussed, they are clearly explicit in this document. Mm. I mean, professional status of doctoral candidate mm. and uh, professional treatment uh, to doctoral training. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. doctoral education is no education more. 
it's not no it's not longer study it's a research but an early stage career development and this is the main difference maybe the question you've put uh, that so uh, will it be, uh, will the doctoral education be saved maybe education not but doctoral research doctoral training in terms of professional attitude mm. to the uh, research activities as well as to people who are involved engaged into this doctoral mm. training actually I think my personal and uh, Eurodoc mm -hmm. point of view is mm -hmm. that doctoral education must be transformed, really transformed into doctoral training and doctoral research mm -hmm. from the professional mm -hmm. point of view with the professional status of doctoral candidates, not like students. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think, firstly, I mean, I can't consult every single document. I think I read about 100 sources already to prepare this presentation. And I, I'm actually partially representing the UK Council for Graduate Education in the UK, which, which works with staff, academic and administrative staff, who work with doctoral students. So that's, and that and the policy perspective is where I was coming from. If I was giving a presentation about doctoral students, then I would have referenced those kind of things. So you cannot cover everything. In, in a 40-minute presentation. Maybe you can, but most people can't. So I think your point is valid, but I'm not sure what the di distinction is that you're making between professional training and education. Because that's, if you look at the field of training and education, that's one of the biggest disputes about what, how that boundary is policed. And you haven't given any particular reasons. What does professionalised training mean? Does it mean that the people who give it are professionalised? Does it mean the people who do it are professionalised? If we look at professional doctorates, which I think probably your group does not represent, because most of those are part-time students, then they would say they already are professional, and what they're using is their job experience and their professional practice as a basis for the, for the problematics that they investigate in your research. So it's not a straightforward... There aren't one set of students with one set of interests. There are a lot of different groups. So I think, yeah, I don't disagree that that's an important thing, but there are lots and lots of things that you can include. I mean, this is really the only presentation virtually in the whole conference which actually tries to look at doctoral education as a whole. So I think it's quite difficult to include every single thing that everybody's ever written, because that's impossible. So I think your point is, is a useful one, but I really think you need to go back and question what is this difference, distinction that you're making between education and training? Because there's a huge literature on that in the field of higher education, and I'm not sure that what you said really starts to make that contribution. It may in your own discussions, but what you said just there didn't make it very clearly. Thank you. We have three more questions, and uh, I fear that this is all for today. Four. Well, please be short, and we will put all four of them. Uh, yes. Yeah. So actually, I haven't a question, but more a comment of something we should look at. It's not a criticism, but just something in addition. I think it's really worthwhile to look at the professional doctorates and the industrial doctorates to see as a major change. And since you mm. mentioned mm. that mm. they actually mm. have become very important in the US, we should also take into account that we have an increasing decline of the employers investi investing in the education of their employees. Mm. Mm. So what we can see, it's part of a shift and a try of a shift of the industry mm. Mm. to outsource the cost mm. of, yep. the, of the training. And now I yep. use the word training because mm. it's kind of uh, employ employment related training. Mm. But basically what they do is they try to have access to public money, taxpayers' yeah. money, in order to save yeah. costs yeah. on their own sure. training. Yeah. And I think sure. we should kind of take all also the changes yeah. within the economy yeah. and the, this attempt of the sure. employee, uh, employers sure. into account to understand changes sure. within the PhD, the doctorates. Yeah, yeah. No, I think, I think that's really important because I think that the difference between the industrial and the professional doctorates and, and the standard PhD is that the people are generally already in some kind of employment, typically professional employment. And so what they are doing, and they're usually part-time, and what they're doing is quite different. But in a way, the contradiction is that what they're doing is useful to their employers as well as to them, but as you say, increasingly the employers don't want to pay for it, just as they don't want to pay for graduates to be work-ready, even though they don't really know what that means. So I think that's a very good point. Uh, thank you for a great presentation. 
I don't really have a question, it's more of a comment, but I, I just wanted to point at an interesting uh, tension that I noticed from my own um, research about, I mean, talking about these trends in doctoral education. It's interesting to, so we look at these shifts and we see, okay, the focus has changed, and at least how it appears in policy. And the tension that I've, I found in my research is very interesting because on the one hand, I looked at all these, um, well, rather old OECD and World Bank, Bank documents that sort of uh, just announced the arrival of the knowledge economy, and then they wanted to create knowledge workers to be prepared to work in all the sectors of this knowledge economy and basically to contribute to the, its creation. Mm -hmm. So actually the increase of the number of doctorates was based on this vision that let's create um, PhD uh, candidates in, that can work in all the sectors. Mm -hmm. And then on the other hand now, when I talk to some very uh, you know, key important uh, stakeholders and policy makers mm -hmm. that somehow have, a, have, a, have had a big say in this uh, debate in the first place, they seem to address it from, I mean, the other way around in a sense to respond to the trend. They're saying, well, there's so many uh, doctorates nowadays that of course not everyone can go into academia, so of course we need to reshape the focus because these people are gonna be unemployed if they cannot work in other sectors. Mm -hmm. So it, it's an interesting uh, way how, mm -hmm. you, how mm -hmm. you look at it. Is it, is mm -hmm. it seen as a response to a shift mm -hmm. that has taken place randomly mm -hmm. or is it, mm -hmm. you know, has it been designed already from the beginning mm -hmm. with this, uh, with this mm -hmm. purpose in mind? Mm -hmm. And I think that also, I mean, of course, then you have, may, may have a tension, I guess, um, regarding the expectations of people who enroll in a doctorate? Mm. I mean, do, mm. is, it, is it a, you know, are they being deceived when they enroll in the doctorate because policymakers have a different vision for this? Mm. And also mm. another question that arises is then, do we change the focus of all the doctorates to prepare mm. people for all this, to make them, you know, flexible, the word that mm. you, <laughs> you mm. don't like, and versatile and so on, and, um, mm. because now they, they're wanting to, to have people, generalist skills to work in these different jobs. Mm. But then do we change the focus of all doctorates? Mm, um, and what do we lose mm. if we do that? Because then yeah. how can you be an excellent researcher and also able to work in all these sure. other uh, sectors? Sure. And sure. then of course there's that question of, you know, do, do we have two types of doctorates for people who mm. want to go into different careers mm. And, mm. and so on. So it was just, I mean, I have very many mm. questions responding to your presentation, but just a, just a comment mm. on, on that. I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, I think they're all very important things to raise, but I think this, this question about, well, firstly, yes, it's impossible for somebody to have so many skills they can go into any employment field because that's just not possible. Plus, some of those fields are changing so fast that even if we did start at the beginning of the four-year programme preparing people for it, by the time they got to the end of it, they'd probably already be out of date. So it would be very difficult to do that. But I also think, I think, Marisa, you referred to an overproduction of, of, of people with PhD. But I think, I mean, I've heard the same discussion about first degrees as well. And one of my arguments is, actually, it's much more complicated than that, because if you just take first degrees, if you look at the kinds of jobs that people now do who have degrees, they have transformed it. And one of the good examples of that is university administration. That when I started my career in the dark ages, people didn't actually have even A-levels or any kind of like post-16 qualification to do those jobs. And what they did was, effectively, they typed out reading this. Whereas now, very, very complex tasks are done by those administrators. And many of them have degrees, they may have master's degrees, they may even have PhDs. So the question of whether about there's overproduction does go back to the question of where they are going and whether their gradual acceptance into the labour market will change the nature of the jobs that they do. So I don't think it's a straightforward debate. And again, I think we have to look at the debates that are around other kinds of degrees to inform our discussion because I think that people who work on doctoral education assume that somehow you only look at that literature but I think you have to look at other things as well. Thank you. Um, next. Hi. Um, I, um, oh. <laughs> Scary. No, I don't need it. Um, the, the, I, I love the idea of doctoral supervision being replaced by doctoral surveillance, by the way. But um, <laughs> if, if I just make a few comments from a, a business school perspective, business and management school perspective, um, where, you know, I mean, I only got a job in a, in a business school kind of uh, 26 years ago because there were no PhDs in business then, so they took people like me. Um, it, I think that kind of the, the overproduction, and certainly a gross overproduction of people with doctorates in, in business and management, it's actually due to credentialism, which mm. universities mm. have seen as a revenue source. Mm. So suddenly it's, and what, what we do particularly in, the, uh, in business schools is, is we, we're you know, increasing emphasis on what we call DBAs, which is mm. you know, the Doctor of Business Administration, mm. which I think will soon be surpassed by the EBA, the Emperor of Business Administration. 
which is all about as more and more people in business and industry have got got MBAs. There's a feeling by mm. some people they'd like to be one up on the people mm. that they manage, mm. so they want they want mm. to be a doctor. Mm. And um, speaking cynically, these are people who just want to be called doctor because mm. it's a sure. you know it's a tag they want, and and there are universities willing to sell them mm. um, that mm. title. What what particularly interests me and um, is is the effect that this kind of revenue rent seeking activity mm, mm. pursued by, by certain universities and certainly mm. certain disciplines has on the nature of academic labour in the doctoral mm, supervision or mm, doctoral surveillance yeah, relationship yeah. because I, I certainly experienced that. So relationships with doctoral students which used to be the most important and valuable and stimulating part of my life which mm. is yeah, a real kind of intense intellectual relationship is mm. I find increasingly encroached mm. on mm. by management who mm. are intent to, to speed and shape mm. and, and mm. focus that activity mm. and mm. tell me how to do it, tell mm. me what to do. Mm. And that has a serious detrimental effect, I think, on the students' experience. Because mm. when I mm. talk to my doctoral students who have graduated, they talk about how it's changed their lives. Mm. And that, to mm. me, is the most important thing about mm. having doctoral education. Mm. Um, and, it's, and, and, and I'm finding that, that work increasingly less mm. rewarding mm. because I increasingly have less control over that aspect mm. of, of mm. work. And, mm. and I think it's something really worth... It used to be the last bastion of the thing we could defend. Mm. Yeah, it used yeah. to be the last thing that we could, you know, we could say that we controlled. Mm, and mm. That particularly we control in the examination process. Mm, mm. And, and I think that's rapidly being mm, eroded, mm. you know. Mm. Anyway. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing about the DBA and, and degrees of that kind is that firstly they're done on a mass scale, aren't they? So, but, but they're a kind of, they're an interesting example of a professional doctorate because many of the people who do it are not necessarily using their professional practice as the basis for the research, but also because universities are charging very, very high fees as they are with the MBA. Now the MBA has already started to collapse in many countries. So my guess is that if the MBA collapses, the DBA is going to also be questioned. But I mean, your point about supervision not being special anymore, I think that that was one of the things I was trying to say that because of the all the things that are happening, that the more students you have, the less easy it is to see it as, as something that's special. But also because lots of other people have a view about how you should do it, many of them with very little idea of what it actually means to supervise a doctoral student. So the kind of things that they focus on and the metrics are not necessarily the things that, that you would actually be interested in. I think it's very difficult to kind of... I mean, I think we have to be more resistant to some of those things, but there is a difference between ensuring that students get a good, consistent experience doesn't mean it's the same, but it means at least it kind of makes sense, and actually interfering in the process just for the sake of interfering. Because some people just like to interfere because they're busybodies, basically, uh, and that doesn't help. So I think both that and, and the question about these kind of big-scale, very high-fee jobs, there's a very special issue, I think, around business schools and their role in, in what happens in the world. And, you know, one could say that they're responsible for quite a lot of the evils that have happened in the world, as well as some of the better things. And that doesn't solve the problem, but it seems to me that is a kind of very special arena, because one of the issues about doctorates in general is that they you know even in countries where they charge fees the fees often don't in any sense represent the amount of work that goes into it so uh, in many systems students stop paying fees or stop paying the full fee after a certain time so if they haven't finished that may be the most intensive period of supervision but it's the period when the institution's getting very little money so there, there's all sorts of paradoxes in the overall experience as well i think thank you i hope that uh, you allowed us to Take a few drops of your coffee for the last question, yeah? And the rest of the discussion at the coffee break. Hi. Um, the Careers Research and Advisory Centre was commissioned by Hefke to undertake a study. I've referenced that in the in the. Yeah. I mean, they actually yeah. found that in terms of uh, employers, the demand for professional doctorates was quite low insofar as employers didn't see the value of them. And further, they indicated that there is evidence that many of the models that were developed in the UK will be unsustainable without international participation, the demand for which is harder to assess. And we found that ourselves in that we get lots of large numbers of Saudi students who will come over for a PhD traditional 
We cannot recruit them to any other program because their ministry does not understand it and therefore will not fund it. Mm. So do you not think there'll be a move away from professional doctors and to some extent they seem now to be, I suppose, less original, less worthwhile than they used to be, as far as employers are concerned at least? Well, I mean, firstly, I don't think I was... I wasn't making that argument. I was presenting that, that Tim Blackman from Middlesex University made that argument, so I wasn't making that argument. But I think, I mean, I, was, I, have, I have a lot of criticisms of that crack document on, on professional doctors, because I think gr giving a group of people, um, most of whom had no experience of professional doctors, a hefty project to do is probably not the best preparation for a good piece of research, um, but they deliberately made that decision. Um, but I think this question about employers and whether they value it, it's a bit like kind of asking students. It depends how you ask them, where you ask them, when you ask them. Because, for example, if you just take something like... The, the, the successes probably have been in things like professional doctors in the field of psychology, where in many countries you can't actually practice unless you've got one of those. Now, in that instance, the employers do, in some systems, not all, actually pay quite a lot towards it. But if you take another one, which is education, which is one of the biggest fields as well. Now, the employers will say they don't want to pay for it, but it doesn't mean they don't value it. In some systems, they do. In the Scottish system, that's the progression. That once you've done... Well, obviously, because the, f the first degree is still... A technically, if it's an honours degree, is a master's degree in Scotland, then the professional development's done through the professional doctorate. I actually think it's much, much more complicated than that report actually says. But I, the thing about international students, I think you're quite right, is that international students from some countries have a particular notion, or their sponsors have a particular notion, of what constitutes a doctorate. And anything that weakens that. So in the UK, we often ask people to be registered initially for an MPhil. Now, some people will refuse to accept that, because to them, that's not the degree. So I think that question about international students and their understanding of what a doctorate means is very, very complicated, actually. And I don't think we've resolved that. And I think you're right, they're not going to go onto those kind of programmes. But it isn't just the UK that's doing professional doctors. I mean, there's, you know, there are a lot of industrial doc doctorates in, in Germany and France. So it's not just something that's done in, in a few countries. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure how much that was really a degree... That was actually a Bologna process issue, actually. I mean, I think that they look at that level, but they don't necessarily make recommendations or principles about the professional doctor. The professional doctor came out of a quite different set of... of concerns and factors, actually, I think. And some of that was actually led by the concern that many people who did a part-time doctorate who were in employment struggled to finish so the dropout rate was huge and the assumption was which is actually incorrect that if you did a professional doctorate it'd be better they get through the talk bit the problem is still the dissertation so in that sense it didn't really work thank you rosemary one again for a great presentation and great discussion and this is a little <laughs> <laughs> thank you <laughs> it was really great